What the boat does, you don't do living on a boat. It's not an active, um, you, you exist in the boat. So the, the, the boat is, is this wonderful capsule that keeps you safe out in nature. And uh, when I think of the times when I've been sailing through the night, you know, maybe 200 miles from the nearest other person. And absolute silence, absolute darkness. So, you know, on a moonless night when there's cloud, you can hold your hand in front of your face and not see your hand. Just absolute darkness. And all you can hear is the water passing by the hull and the way and the, the, the wind passing over the sails. And there's just that nothingness and it allows you to really disappear into your thoughts in a way that's simply not possible in, uh, in modern living. to another episode of Board with Nelly. Today I'm joined by Leonard Skinner, who is the author of Escape Under Sail, which arrived actually yesterday. Uh, I only got to read uh, the first four chapters, I think, but uh, so far enjoying it. <laughs> good, good. So you've you've got all the secret background uh, in, in the first four chapters there. You, you know what Mary and I got up to before uh, setting off in the boat? Well, kind of, because the book starts off kind of when you were in your mid thirties or early thirties, you kind of skip over what happened in those years, which I guess maybe I should also give a further, you know, elaboration of what you know what we're talking about. So you've lived on a boat for how many years? Um, six years. Uh, of course, COVID uh, got in the way, and uh, and the the teens. So there was myself and Mary, um, and uh, her two teens, uh, twins, uh, that we moved onto the boat. Um, after they finished primary school here in Ireland, they were um, 13 when we uh, headed off. So essentially what you have is uh, two uh, teens entering puberty and uh, in a 39 foot space with two adults. And we said we'd all live together 24 seven for the next few years uh, without much access to, to a great deal of distraction. It's like a TV show. <laughs> it's like you're making a uh, wild TV show. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, that's that's why we kind of uh, we we turned our hand to YouTube for a little while because, of course, the the big question is always how can you earn money while while you're doing this. Fortunately, we, we both have teaching backgrounds as well, so education wasn't uh, wasn't an issue either. But uh, yeah, we did turn our hand to to uh, YouTube for a little while until it became more like work than fun. Right. And uh, yeah, I, I, I firmly maintain that if you enjoy doing something, never do it for a living because getting paid to do something just spoils. It, it takes the fun out of it. That's so true. Yeah. What, what you, what's your background? You're kind of a renaissance man, right? Yeah, um, I, 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 I've, been, I've been described as uh, as that very thing uh, throughout my life. Um, I get bored easily. Um, and, Speak of the uh, devil, <laughs> this is the perfect What You're at, are, is this a plug for the, I didn't pay him, folks, just to let anyone know this. Was... Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so so, so I, I have a varied background. Uh, I have a lot of interests and my I, I, I tend to, to move on from... Um, uh, from area to area, not necessarily leaving one area behind, but if there's something that I want to learn about or want to know about, then then I am full on and I will just take it as far as it needs to go to to, to get on top of that uh, area or subject. So my professional background uh, is originally electronics and computer programming. Uh, I worked in automotive electronics uh, when I started out where I developed uh, hardware and test uh, and software solutions for all of the big manufacturers. I won't name one, but they were all there. Uh, if if you can think of a, a car brand, uh, particularly the Japanese and, Amer and uh, European market, I worked on those cars. Um, uh, well, on the electronics for them, uh, sensors, drive systems. Actually, we we did um, we, we did uh, I, I I did some a. Uh, 
Oh, I was going to show you. Yeah, I've, I've, there's a lot of similarity seems in our story. I worked on electronics. This is um, it goes into a car and detects when you get in a car accident and it sends it back oh, to your airbag yeah. module. So an accelerometer. Is, yes, a very basic one. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so so I, I suppose in, in that area, my, my claim to fame is that I um, it, I, I wrote the and, and created the developed, I suppose, is the term we would have used the uh, hardware and software solution for testing the Toyota Carina E uh, central locking system. Oh, cool. That way, yeah. So, so uh, it, it, in a way, you, you know, I've uh, I've had my hands in the in the uh, central locking system of, of a lot of Toyotas, uh, but yeah, I, I did that for um, about ten years uh, working in, in electronics, and I loved electronics um, from a very early age. Uh, I, I was a computer and technology nut, you, you know. Um, and but I found that as much as I love electronics, because it was a hobby, uh, technology was a hobby of mine in my spare time. Uh, and as much as I loved it, I found that after a few years in industry, it was just the same thing over and over. Um, like I'm, I'm sure a lot of programmers will identify w with the task of the, you you get your your brief and you sit down and instead of sitting down to a blank screen to create a new program, you're pulling a piece from this program and a piece from that program. And once you've done that for uh, a sufficient length of time, you never write anything new. And you have all your subroutines written, and it just becomes monotonous. And uh, and and something happens to me um, in that situation where I feel that actually I need to move from this. And the minute that triggers in my brain, uh, maybe it's the, the Aspergers. The minute that triggers in my brain, I know within six months I will be doing something else. Uh, it, it's yeah, no. so. To, to carry on with the my professional background is engineering. Uh, I went back to university and uh, I was thinking, um, I go in the morning into the factory, I get my briefs for the day, and I'm I'm applying my skills to make money for people that I've never met. They're somewhere else on the other side of the globe, shareholders or whatever. What's the job that I could do where I'm interacting directly with those people uh, who might benefit from my skills or or my knowledge or the the work that I'm putting in? And I thought teaching w would be a good one to get into. Um, so I went back to university and um, I did a teaching degree. Uh, now, fortunately, uh, with my engineering background, they suggested that, that I do uh, technology, engineering, material science, that sort of Mathematics. Uh, teaching. Uh, mathematics, yeah. Um, so, so I gave a few years then teaching maths, um, technology, engineering, uh, engineering, drawing, that sort of thing in sort of the the more vocational end of the uh, school system here in Ireland. Um, and it was it was good. It was interesting. Loved working in the classroom, but the again, the, the, there's just the bureaucracy behind yes. education, and yes. yeah. Uh, well, what I found was quite often there was more interest in were the kids wearing the right uniform, were they, and and I discovered um, that actually education, unfortunately, these days is nothing more than job training. Uh, you know, th th there's the constant. Well, so so uh, after I graduated, I, I actually taught in the university for for a couple of years um, as a postgrad as uh, as well. But it, it's it's increasingly uh, it increasingly became evident that. Education is nothing more than job preparation. The, the whole thing is just one vocational conveyor belt. That's um, not the best, I would say. I would, I would say that's like the best case scenario. Sometimes it's not even yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so so it, it's it's interesting. I've I've written a few pieces uh, over the years about uh, primary school being nothing more than childcare for the masses. It is, and yeah. it really upsets teachers when I say that. <laughs> Everybody in the staff room moves away from Leonard when he starts talking about things like that. And, you know, I'm left eating my sandwich by myself. Um, but after a while, um, I, 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 of course, education doesn't just have to be in a school setting. So I moved into a, 
um, what we call in Ireland a youth reach um, education setting, which is officially the term it's second chance education. I, I really dislike that term because what it actually is, is uh, an opportunity for education for people for whom mainstream education didn't work. So they fell through the cracks or maybe um, there was some difficulty with the authorities or maybe they were early school leavers. Socioeconomic um, issues might have led to uh, to their education um, difficulties. Any number of reasons why people would have ended up in this system. And I, I, I took to that a little more. Um, there was no uniforms Um People were just glad that these kids were in education, and their um, it, it, uh, the the relationship mattered a good deal more. And you really were connecting with people who were using education not necessarily just to get a job, although that was the aim within the system. But for the kids themselves, uh, quite often it was an opportunity to be seen as something other than what their peers would see them uh, as on the street. They, they could learn to weld. They could learn, um, you name it, in the engineering room, I had all the best toys and we'd make use of them. And, and of course, the conversations were, is where the real education happens. Uh, you know, I think it was Stephen Fry that said that uh, lessons happen, or that, that the real learning in school happens in between the lessons. You, you know. I think it's a fascinating thing that school's what they're becoming, in, in a sense. Like, it's just getting worse and progressively worse, where I'm seeing more people, this was not the norm 20, 40, whatever years ago. They're saying, do not go to school, find your own way, build your own thing, try to solve your own problems that unless you're talking about a specifically technical field, like, you know, engineering, well, even then maybe you can do it on your own, but let's say being a lawyer, being a doctor, those things. Yeah. Yeah. You need to go to the school route, but. Yeah. Well, what I would say is, um, so if you want to learn, then there's a myriad of ways uh, in which you can learn anything you want, you, you know, and, and I, I, I have a real issue uh, with lots of things, clearly. Um, I, uh, but but the certification, you, you know, uh, quite often I might be chatting with friends uh, and they're talking about this course or that course and the certificate is really well recognized and, and these sort of things. And countless times I, I'd say to them, oh, you want to search? Uh, let me just go to the computer. I'll run, up, we'll run one up for you. <laughs> I can there Photoshop you that in 10 minutes, nice- yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a nice certificate. I'll sign it. I'll put all my letters after it. And 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 the thing is that you could produce any cert in any printer. And 99 times out of 100, no one will question the validity of that certificate. Well, that's what an engineering degree has sort of become. It is a giant <laughs> yeah, printer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just... yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, uh, it, it, it's a funny thing. Um, like I, I was just chatting with somebody the other day around um, uh, marine surveying. So uh, sailors uh, tend to be nervous sorts and, and they want um, everything to be right on the boat. Uh, I, I have taken no tuition in, in sailing, um, despite sailing across Biscay with a family. Um, I, I did the exam and I got the license, but I didn't do any of the courses. And of course, you know, the, 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 those who are running, um, the, you'll find this in the book, uh, the, those who are running the, the training courses and everything, one of them warned me that I'd be arrested if I turned up in Portugal without having done their course. Really? You know, and uh, yeah. And now they were running the RYA, which is the British standard course. And I said, oh, my God. Do all the Americans who sell to Portugal know that unless they have your RYA course, they'll be arrested? And and of course, he would say, "Oh no, 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 that that's not what I'm." Well, that's what you said, right. you know. And and of course, the, the, this nonsense of of um, of certification, but people absolutely believe it because from day one, it, it's it's all they hear. And it's it's like North Korea syndrome. You know, if you're told nothing else, you absolutely believe the reality in which you sit. So, so yeah, I, I the, the marine surveyors, I, I, and th- this is topical because I was having this conversation just the other day with somebody, and they were talking about surveying their boat. And I said, would you not consider surveying it yourself? Honestly, you, you know, critique it properly. You know your boat better than anybody else. 
And he said, no, I, I can't do that. I'm not certified. And what most sailors don't realize is there is no governing body um, that stands over the certification of marine surveyors. My neighbor's spaniel could set up a marine surveying business and hand out surveys and certify it and, and stamp the, the, the forms and everything. And nobody will say anything. But people feel that if, you're, if there isn't a, a qualified certifying something or other, then, uh, and, and countless times, I guess because I live in the boat and live outside or at the very least at the fringes of society, I've, I've uh, a lot of time on my hands, I suppose, to explore these things. Uh, another good example of a certifying body was... Uh, a friend of mine was thinking of doing a course in um, oh, life coaching. And uh, yeah, and they were saying, no, 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 this is different. You know, this is certified by the European life coaching something, something, something. Oh, oh okay. So the course that you're doing with this educational provider is certified by this European life something or other. And I looked into it, and they were actually the ones who had set up this educational uh, funding thing. And the European one was attached to the world one, who just happens to have the same managing director uh, across all three of them. So it's certificates all the way down. It's a big pyramid scheme. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're illegal, so I wouldn't go that far. I, I, but yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And unfortunately, education, even the, the very best universities in the world, are saying our certificates are good because our neighbor is saying that they checked and they're saying they're good. But of course, their neighbor is saying the same thing and so on, so on, so on. So, yeah, but all of that, having said all of that, whilst education is absolutely ubiquitous and you can learn anything that you want these days in a few minutes online. Because of the tendency of society to put faith in certification, um, when you do have a degree, uh, so any, any people out there thinking, will I skip out an education? When you wave your degree in the air, it opens doors for you. Whatever the degree is, uh, it doesn't matter. But if um, I, I, I can honestly say we could not have gone sailing um, uh, for as long as we did, and we could not have operated outside or on the fringes of society without being able to say, oh, yeah, well, obviously I, I have a first-class degree and I have a master's and I have a, you know, um, because instantly when you approach a, a publishers or instantly when you approach um, a funding body for a project or something, they th they look at you and they say, okay, so you're not um, you you gave up working in industry by choice. It's not that you weren't qualified. So clearly, to say you're here and you're certified, you're here by choice. So you must be very motivated. So here have this project, or here have this um, job, or here uh, have this writing deal, uh, as the case may be. So. As much as I dislike the the way the the world runs on certificates, you, you have to recognize that the game is 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 on. And if you know how to work within the rules of the game, then that can be very useful for stepping outside of the game. It's it's recognizing though that it is a game. This is maybe like a, a good metaphor. It's like a part of human evolution. We still have this part of us that's still coming in every you know generation, but we're not using it as much. We're starting to like realize maybe we don't, maybe we didn't need nipples as, as guys or something like that. Whatever it may be, <laughs> like it's there. You should probably have yeah. one. You know, it's good to have yeah. one, but like, I don't know if you really need it for anything. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Certainly in the gig economy, um, it's about what you can produce. Um, but in order to get that foot in the door, to get the ball rolling, you need to be able to talk yourself up. It's it's a bit like a teenager going to a supermarket looking for a job bagging uh, groceries. Um, they turn up with their CV and it has their name and their address on it and nothing else. You, you know, maybe I did some litter collecting or something like that. But the minute they get that part-time job, then all of a sudden somebody else sees, oh, you're, you're worthwhile. Somebody else thought 
it took the risk. So I don't feel so bad if I take the risk because if it fails, I can blame them for for setting me up wrong. And if I'm right, then I win. So it, it's you it's know like when people, you become more attractive to girls when when you have a girlfriend or something like that. It's like <laughs> absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. Or in the case of cars, um, you'll always it's always easier buy another car when you are have been driving a car. You, you know, it's right. it's that piece where you're in the circle. Then I should say I originally found you not through your book about sailing. That was a part of the description, but I found a TED video where you talked about you know how much does it cost. Um, how much does it cost you to work? And I thought that was a very interesting video when I was a, a younger lad looking for what I want to do with my life. And then I kind of, as I continued looking into, into you, and I realized, oh, well, we have a, quite a few things in common here. It was fascinating to see how many people were also drawn to that video, but I'm, I'm wondering how many people actually did something to change their environment. Yeah, there's, so I have, I have gotten emails um, from people um, Two or three of them it was just one or two lines. Uh, I left work. To, uh, I, I left work this morning after watching this video. Really? You know? Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was it was that dramatic, and I'm thinking, no, d- 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 this is <laughs> <laughs> delete email, delete email. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And but afterwards, I was I was sort of thinking, well. The, Yes, it, it, it's it's an important uh, piece. For those who haven't seen it, go and watch it. But um, it, it briefly, it, what it did was um, because I, 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 as I mentioned in the in the talk, I love statistics, and and it's amazing what you can do with them. It, it's almost like plasticine. You know, you hold them up and you put them together, and you see what comes out of them. And quite often, the statistics that come out um, are completely different to what the news media might be putting out or what general acceptance right. is. Or what you is, think is, is the norm. Um, yeah. So, so, so in, in, the, in that talk, uh, I, I talk about how many hours we actually have available to us. And uh, I think I start with talking about when I was born in 1973, uh, back in the black and white days. Um, I... Uh, my life expectancy was 69.8 years or something like that, you know, and now I'm 48. So strictly speaking, I've only got about 21 years left. Now, the difficulty, of course, with um, having people face this is the issue of death denial, which is part of human evolution. We probably wouldn't have made it past 100,000 years without denying our own mortality, because what is there to live for, uh, sort of thing. And, and it's all meaningless. And these other existential questions pop up, um, which is where my head is most of the time. I, I, I spend most of my my days w- with that existential um, uh, pieces running in the background. Um, but the, the, the piece that sort of stands out for me. Um, so the video was about trying to communicate this idea to um, Joe and Jane Doe out there <clears throat> commuting, as I did myself for many right. years. So I had to put it in terms of um, your hours and working week and, and how many hours you'd have to work before you even paid for the fuel for your car to get to work. And I think the bottom line was that it, like the last 40 or 50 minutes of any working day is all you're actually earning to feed and clothe your family. And, and so this was our rationale for moving onto the boat, that how can you afford to move onto the boat? And the truth was that a family of four with two teens, uh, we existed um, quite comfortably uh, on the boat for about 100 euro per week was all it cost. I used to spend more than that um, on diesel just driving to and from work uh, every week. But of course, the thing is that when you reduce your costs, then you reduce the amount that you have to earn for for the same lifestyle. So uh, a a good example that uh, I I love to cook, uh, as as a teen, I, I worked in a restaurant, kitchens, several of them. And one of the things I like to to talk about is uh, w- with people who um, who feel that they need to earn more money is, is that piece when you go on holiday, if you have an apartment and you cook your breakfast, so you cook your fry up, your, uh, your bacon and eggs and, you know, 
uh, rather than eating out in the restaurant, you can cook probably for 10 mornings instead of one morning in the restaurant. So that allows you to extend your vacation then by 10 times if, if you behave that way. And if you extend that out then uh, by not wanting or not having a car, as, as was the case when we were on the boat, then instantly we had all of this um, lack of expense coming back in our lap, which meant that we had to work a lot less. And, and that was the, 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 the whole play on, on the TED Talk. Um, but as far as people responding to it, a lot of people, when they sat in the audience or watched it, and I got emails back, and when people first see it, it really motivates them. And then they talk about how it's, yeah, we, we're, we're just selling our time, and we're, we're not getting any younger. We're going to die, and these companies are buying up all of our life uh, force and, and that. It's like a Pixar movie. And then they go, uh, yeah, and then they go to bed, and they get up the next morning, they go to work, and they forget all about it. And I was quite frustrated by this. And I was thinking, why, why don't people listen? <laughs> you know, why isn't this an epiphany? Um, why and, is this just a momentary thing? Yeah. And, and it's, not, it, it's not in some conceited sort of way, why won't they listen to me? Because reading, um, I'm not the first person to say this, you know, Bukowski um, said this 50 years ago. I, um, Epicurus said it 2,000 years ago, and people won't listen. And every 100 years or so, there's a great thinker who comes along and publishes it, and it's widely known, but they don't listen. And I was thinking, uh, why is this the case? And the truth is that only those in pain will listen to the potential um, for change. If you're not suffering or if you're not in pain, then you will just carry on with the status quo. There, there's no motivation for change. Pain can be mental, though. That's the thing. Maybe some people are thinking that pain is physical. No, this is mental pain. This could be like... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's that that feeling. It's First of all, it's experiencing the trappedness, but then identifying that that's what it is. Because for so many people, they would experience depression or mental illness um, and, and so on and so forth. And rather than recognize, rather than saying, where is this coming from? They'll go to the doctor and they'll get some pills mm -hmm. or they the will. Way out or the whatever yeah. societal way out. Yeah. Or even go to talk therapy, which uh, I absolutely, it, it works wonders for people. Um, it, you know, counseling and, and psychotherapy is very important fields that do wonderful things for people. But unfortunately, most of the practitioners in those areas uh, or the, the areas themselves have been developed to help people cope with existing in normal society. So what you have is a society that's developing in a way that is contrary to our evolutionary development. Um, and it's increasingly putting us on this treadmill of, of uh, mono skills where you're on the, on the assembly line putting the same component in the same box day after day, or you're pulling the same pint in the bar, or you are putting the same can of beans on the shelf. And it's, it's this repetition, and, and we are not designed as mono-skilled beings. We're multi-skilled beings. You, you know, we, we wouldn't survive like that uh, 10,000 years ago. So the, the whole area then, of course, of, of therapy and psychotherapy um, is, is there to help people survive in this, what is actually an abnormal um, social setting for the, the, evolutionary, uh, the, the evolutionary human. Uh, if you like, I'm not sure how we got onto that. Yeah, no, I, we were talking about uh, the yeah. TED Talk, but but the, I, I guess I could just clarify my story a little bit of what I've been trying to kind of tell people. I, I used to work in automotive as well, electrical engineering background. I did three years. I worked for big companies, Ford, Chrysler, um, uh, ZF, German company, electronics. Mm. And, you know, when I graduated out of university at 23, I was, you know, overwhelmed, first of all, by how hard those four years were. As you probably know yourself, that field is brutal and, and very difficult, very demanding. And I kind of thought to myself, okay, well, what, what what's next in life? It, is this 
is this the I made it moment? Because everyone talks about once you get the degree, you get a good job, which is, you know, most people in that mm-hmm. field do. And then that day came where I did get a good job and it was a good paying job. And, mm-hmm. you know, I come to the office and first day goes by, I'm like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's it. I mean, all right, we'll yeah. give it a week. A week goes by, a month goes by, it's four months go by and it's just like, it's, is this, is this it? Like, it, this is my life. I'm in a cubicle now. Like I have great money, but I'm in a prison 40 hours yeah. of the week and, and another vehicular prison the other 10 hours of the week. But no one can really mm-hmm. understand that from a smaller city. If you make a good salary, no one can like, Oh dude, how can you complain about such things? Like you're, you're doing well. Some people are making, I'm, I think ungrateful is not the word I would want to use, but I'm saying if it's irrelevant to me, what your definition of um, happiness or great gratefulness mm. is because if I'm unhappy, it doesn't really matter what the people around me are. So I kind of started looking at like, what's the alternative? What, what else can I do? And that kind of mental prison forced me to kind of step out of my own comfort zone and do something I did yeah. like, which was make a video, social media, podcasting with you today, stuff like that. And through my own desire, I learned more skill sets than I did in years of schooling and engineering. And that kind of allowed me to transition into a more time time free job to a job that I more enjoy more the one that I don't have to commute to work I can work on my own schedule things like that maybe it's not the perfect job I don't even know if there is a such thing but it's definitely a lot closer I feel like I've moved towards the right path and I'm now trying to see if I can help other people find a similar I don't think I think jobs in general are just going to be tough like you said if you love something and you do a job at it you're probably going to hate it eventually yeah so how do we minimize yeah. the amount of time you have to do something you hate to maximize the time you do something you love yeah, yeah, I, 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 that that of course is is the big question. But I would uh, so I find myself um, was it was it Twain? It, it, somebody said that if if you can uh, make money from doing something that you really love, you'll never work a day in your life. Um, now, I I think what a lot of guidance counselors and teachers and parents took from that because they they roll that one out you know when kids are trying to pick what to do in college or what career path you want and they say oh you like um legos so maybe you should be a builder or uh, better still why don't you become a civil engineer you, you know and they send them off to to college um to to ruin their enjoyment of building <laughs> but uh the, the thing is, I, I suppose what I do uh, for a living now at this stage is I get up in the morning and I I follow what suits me. Uh, I This morning, I, at, the, at the moment, I'm writing a bit on um, a, a relationship uh, model that I'm working on. Um, so I've been reading and writing a, a, a bit about that. And... Uh, and and that's that's what I'm at at the moment. And fortunately, as I go along, a, a few coins fall out of the projects that I work on. But because I have no expectations around how much I need, I, I can get by on very very little. Then I, uh, I I I think that's where the pleasure is for me. Literally, not seeking out for not seeking out work. Um, not looking at how much can I get paid for anything that I'm doing, but mm-hmm. just the, the knowledge that um, the, the little bits that I am doing, a few coins drop out and that's enough to, to keep things ticking over. Of course, I do have the skills to fall back on uh, which uh, with which I can have the confidence to step away from work. I can, uh, I can go back to teaching if I needed to in the morning. There's always a shortage of teachers. So I do have that comfort, and that's where the waiving the certificate helps. But uh, as far uh, as seeking happiness, which is the Epicurean ideal, and I, I don't mean the the um, semi-modern take on uh, the ideas of Epicurus, which is these hedonistic large meals and sexual orgies and all that. The... the, 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 the um, People are coming around to recognize, actually, that, that the writings say that he, essentially a cheese sandwich in good company is all you need to be happy. <laughs> you know, the, the conversation uh, has with to be a really family. good cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, that's that's the thing. Um, it, it's I, I suppose I've always maintained that um, 
the, the, the most powerful man in the world is the man that can't be bought. Uh, I've been offered jobs over the past few years. Uh, well, one guy offered me four grand for a one month project. I said, no, I'm, I'm not feeling it. And he, he, he had no, he, he had no perception of how anyone could turn down this. He, he clearly wasn't used to being turned down and he was quite upset by it and offended the, you know, and I, I said, I'm just no interest in money. I, I really, it, it doesn't do it for me. I have to be satisfied. Um, so it, it's, it's a bit, um, how did he react to that? How did he react to that? Oh, well, well, it, it it reminds me of of a, a story. I, I uh, God, I, I read a bit of uh, philosophy for, from time to time. Uh, it's it's sort of my my guide. I, I take my guidance from the philosophers rather than the saints, uh, unlike many Irish people. <laughs> but uh, th- th- there's a story goes that the original um, one of the original cynics, Diogenes, um, and he's he's. He lives in a barrel. Uh, forgive me uh, if if you you know this story. That's okay. Um, you can tell it. You can tell it. But he, yeah, so he's living in a barrel in the middle of the town center and uh, <laughs> the city center, and uh, and he's quite often lies naked on the on the footpath and uh, barks like a dog. He he has he's given up everything, you know, and is quite content with this. Uh, he is known for heckling Plato, you know, ooh, 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 what a thing to be known for. And Alexander the Great turns up in town and he hears of this great cynic philosopher, Diogenes, and he stands before him and he says, uh, I'm Alexander the Great. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Is there anything I can do for you? And he looks up at him and he says, uh, yeah, just take a couple of steps to the left. You're blocking my sunlight. <laughs> So, so yeah, the story good, that's a good goes. Story, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but the story goes that Alexander says to him, you know, if I were not Alexander the Great, I would want to be Diogenes. Right. To which Diogenes replies, and if I were not Diogenes, I too would want to be Diogenes. <laughs> so, the, the, essentially, the, the lesson there is the, the man that can't be bought it really has it all. He has right. all of the power because there is nothing this great emperor could do to improve this guy's day or to punish him or to, to do anything. So if you can get to that place where you I don't actually want anything, um, then obviously that's the ultimate happiness. But That reminds me, I actually have, I do have a bit of a story with that because when I was quitting my, my final engineering job, I kind of had my life planned out. My, my plan over the last couple of years has been unfortunately kind of ruined a little bit by COVID, but I took a little vacation to Europe and I was trying to figure out where I want to live because Canada is very cold. And after exploring, you know, Portugal, Spain, Italy, I finally said, okay, I'm going to go to Spain. I'll try to do a degree there. Things happen where I actually got a job and I need to do that. But I knew that was the plan. So I took my final job saying, doesn't matter what happens in nine months. I'm out of here. I'm here to collect the check. Yeah. Goodbye. So the last day of work, I'm coming in. And also, mind you, I met a friend along the way in, you know, three, four months before that, who I've somehow convinced to do the same thing. So we're quitting on the same day. So, yeah. <laughs> so he quits in the day shift. I'm working the night shift. Um, <laughs> at two o'clock, he's, he's like, I'm heading out, dude. I just quit. It felt so good. I, you know, good luck with yours. He hangs up. I go in. Same thing. Ah, uh, hey. And these are two young engineers they just hired like five months ago. So, you know, I'm like, hey. <laughs> I have a plan. I'm actually just going to move to Spain in a few months. <laughs> I don't really need this job. He's like, "What? It, are we not paying you enough? Like, would you like a <laughs> would you like a ten like ten k increase?" I'm like, "No, I wouldn't." Oh. But I, I didn't know that was on the table. It's good to know for future. Like, thank you so much. He's like, "Is there yeah. some?" It's like this. Uh, it's like how do I describe? It's like a, a girl that you're breaking up with. It's like super irrational. It's like, "What well, did I do something?" It's like, "No, no, no, you." Yeah. It's not you. It's like I was just gonna quit this regardless. It wasn't. It wasn't an outcome you had any say in. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's a really good moment. It does feel good. Something about it that, that maybe that's how he felt that day when Alexander the Great asked him. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I and uh, but that's the thing. Now, one of the exercises I used to do with the the kids in school, um, just around these things, um, uh, you know, uh, acquisitiveness and and uh, striving and attainment and and happiness and all of these things. Um, you, you know, if if you um, if you think of your favorite movie, 
you know, uh, it, it, whatever it might be. And you think of watching it as, as a child, and it was a great movie. Now, suddenly you get a 50-inch uh, plasma TV. Is the movie any better, really? You know, uh, it's, it's, marginally, it's still a maybe. great movie. Yeah, maybe marginally, or maybe not. Yeah, oh, <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it's the, the, what I've found is, is that a good book is still a good book, regardless of, of the quality of the paper, and a good movie is still a good movie, whether it's on a, a 50-inch TV or a 32-inch TV. True, it's, right? it's it, yeah. Or if, um, so I, I recall one of the girls in the classroom, and I said to her, what is it that you want? Well, you know, right now, I'm your fairy godmother. You can have it. And she described this luxury car and, you know, spinners and the color of it and all the lights and everything. And it's brand new. And uh, she talked about the plates being brand new. I said, okay, so we're, you, you're in the car, you're driving, you're, you're, you're cruising, you pull up to a set of lights and you have the car about six months and you look across and there's the next model of the exact same car. How much do you love your car now? No, no, I want the other one now. Right. Yeah. So wow. clearly that car isn't the key to your happiness. You know, the key to your happiness is actually how people perceive you while you're in the car. Right. Yes. And and she said, well, yeah, yeah, I, I guess that's the case. And then I was saying, well, so the key to your happiness is actually you feeling content with other people looking up to you. So it's actually that you want a position in society. OK, so maybe that's what I want. So not the car, not the people adoring you. It's the position. It's and eventually the human you, you go through all the yeah. things. What? It's root causing yeah, the human yeah, condition, yeah. trying to figure so, out where so that stems from, it, right? Yeah, and and um, as, as Matthew Ricard says, the you know the the, the French monk, uh, Buddhist monk, he talks about how um, he, he's he spent his life studying happiness, and uh, he talks about you know maybe happiness is a slice of chocolate cake, but what if you have a second slice and a third slice, and suddenly you're you're feeling a bit icky and you've eaten too much. So, I I don't think happiness is that and. It's it's in Epicurean terms or in Buddhist terms, it's it's the absence of suffering, you know. And and if you can get used to being in that quiet space, which makes a lot of people really uncomfortable, um, then if you can enjoy that space, then for me, that's the most satisfying thing, you know. Which is why sailing suited me. Um, yeah, crossing the skate. I guess we can talk about sailing as, as well. As well, I mean, <laughs> you did a little bit of that. I totally forgot. We've been we almost did forty minutes. I didn't even ask a question about boats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for I mean, I guess okay. For for more technical questions about like costs and stuff, like I don't want to bore people with that kind of stuff. I, if you want to figure out how much things cost, it's all well put in the book. You can check it out. I am more interested, I guess, back into the you know psychological stuff. What what it felt like when you first decided that you wanted to go do this and stuff like that. So when did you for officially decide, I want to live on a boat for an extended period of time? Okay, so um, I came to sailing very late. I was in my mid-30s. Um, I, when I went back to university and got my teaching degree, I thought, okay, I'd like to learn to sail. And I bought a small boat, a little 17-footer on a lake. And I had the book in one hand and a rope in the other hand. And I went over and back the lake. You know, I, I put up the head sail and sailed over and back. And I thought, okay, yeah, I understand the physics of it. Uh, this is my first time sailing, but I got this. And I took down the head sail and then I put up the main sail and I sailed over and back. And I thought, okay, I totally have this. Then I put up both sails. The whole thing leaned over and I took them all down. And I thought, okay, that's too far. <laughs> and that's it, it, so it kind of went on from there. But um, when I met uh, Mary, the co-author of the book, and my partner, um, we were sitting around the kitchen table one evening, and I said to her, um, "Do you fancy sailing about the world?" And she looked at me and she said, "Go on, so." <laughs> and that was it. And we sat down. We got a notepad and pen and made a list of all the things that we would need to achieve that including get a boat that's suitable for sailing out in the ocean um, and learn to sail in the ocean and and other such things. But we are, I want to say we're planners 
Um, but it's it's less about making plans and more about executing them. Um, so Mary left her job in teaching and we set up a theater company um, doing uh, personal development through drama with young people. Um, and we were teaching Shakespeare workshops and things like that to exam grades. Um, and that was interesting. That was that was a, a fun period. Um, so I suppose I left that out when I described education and engineering, also the drama and writing. Mm-hmm. Um, so so we, we just we set a date. Um, it'll, we made a list and we figured it'll take us five years to get ready, um, including organizing the budget and everything. Um, because we didn't have any money to do it either, but th- that hasn't stopped us from uh, doing anything. Um, and it, we actually managed to achieve it in four years because we found the right boat at the right price. And it, the, this, the, the description of finding the boat, of course, is is in the book. But um, it's <laughs> uh, essentially the. Um, it was purely accidental. I was looking for um, bolts in Greece and Italy because and, and France and the UK because essentially wherever you find the boat, you can always bring it back to Ireland to work on it. Oh. Just for the people. Oh, yeah, it's the, the little people, white so one, the, oh, not yep, the big black yeah, one. Yeah, not the big, yep, the little white <laughs> yeah. one. Sorry, I almost didn't get in the frame. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that photograph was taken in Kaz, actually, which is sort of the center of the European yachting world. Oh, really? uh, we, we stopped in there. Yeah, yeah. So that I, I suppose the the wonderful thing about the sailing is the people that you meet on the way. Um, you know, we have sat in French homes and spent our evenings uh, quaffing wine like French people and, and swapping stories. Um, we we've had auberge espagnols where you, everyone brings some food to a picnic table and there might be 20 or 30 vagabonds sitting around playing guitars and and uh, again talking of travels are these stories sorry i uh, interrupt you are these stories in the book cuz i haven't obviously gotten through it yet but i'm yeah. so yeah no pr- primarily um the, the book is pretty much a how to okay it's a utility um, book <laughs> Yeah, okay. there, there are thousands of books out there with stories of, of travel logs and uh, how we got the um, uh, how we got the, the the book deal was by recognizing that the Bloomsbury didn't need another travel log. I got you. But I had a look at their catalog and I recognized that there was a hole in their list um, because in in the publishing world uh, you can write the greatest book ever written. Um, it could be an absolute masterpiece, but if they don't have it on their list as seeking publishing, or the, if they don't have a hole in their um, catalog for it, they won't even open the cover. Wow. Um, so, wow. so be I, I'm I'm good with patterns, so I can take a lot of data and and uh, quickly see where the holes are or where the patterns lay. And when we set off, a, a bit like when we said to our family and friends, oh, we're moving on to a boat and sailing away. And they said, ah, <laughs> of course you are. You know, um, and in the same way as once we set off, we said, oh, we're going writing a book. <laughs> that that's lovely. Have a nice time, you know. Or as, as one friend said, "Oh, do you have a publishing deal or so, or do you have a, a book deal?" And kind of no, but you know, I'm going to write the book and I'll get a deal. Yeah, sure you will. Do you know how many thousands of people, millions of people, try that every day? And I was saying, actually, no, because I've identified that this publishing company has a hole in their catalog right here, and I'm going to write that book and send it to them. And I, we did. Uh, and that day they got back to us and they said, um, don't do anything. Um, the girl who wants to look at this is on holidays. I'll get back to you, but don't talk to anybody else. Wow. And wow. yeah, so so it's it's not some great literary work that will get you published. It's about identifying the, the, the holes in, in the area. Um, so we, we wrote, yeah, the original book, the original title that we had on the book was, um, your liveaboard boat for the price of a secondhand car, because Fween Spare cost us in total in the water insured and ready to sail anywhere in the world, um, 10,000 euro. 
Yeah, I'm, so, uh, are most yeah, people yeah. shocked by that number when you tell them that? Uh, most people don't believe it. They, really? they say, yeah. no, mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. Um, but we have a habit of doing things that people simply don't believe is is possible. Um, I, again, it's because of my engineering background, um, I rebuilt the inside of the boat myself. And um, I we don't have anything on board that I can't repair at sea um when the weather's kicking up you, you know so it's about keeping keeping it simple um we don't have a fridge on board um we we set out the, the fridge conversation is a big conversation amongst liveaboard cruisers because a fridge draws a lot of power so if you want to power a fridge then you're going to have to put in extra batteries and extra solar panels and extra rectifiers etc cetera, etc cetera. and you've got all that extra maintenance and extra cost Whereas in Queen Spare, what we did was we kept a section of the hull beneath the waterline uh, uninsulated, and we used that as like a, a cool box. Right. And uh, we we figured we'd head off, we'd try that for a while, and we'd see how it went. And even when we hit the the warm water, it's still the the the, the white wine isn't perfectly chilled, but you drink red. It's. <laughs> <laughs> That's the title you know, of the next book. Always... The white wine isn't perfectly chilled. <laughs> Just you drink the red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. So we, we um, yeah. That, that, although a, a, a very good German friend of ours who is actually a um, he's like ourselves. He he worked in industry and said, "No, I've had enough of this," and set set off in the boat. He turned up one day uh, for drinks and nibbles, and he had one of these 12 volt cool boxes that chose things because he was sick of having beer that wasn't cold enough for him on our boat. Right, that's fair. <laughs> He's a German. He, he has very specific beer preferences. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's fascinating. A lot of people probably envision themselves, you know, it's always the the thing you hear in movies, oh, we're going to retire on a boat or we're going to set sail and travel the world. But it seems like it's such a probably small community of people, no? Um, it's 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 like one of those things where you know, have you ever learned a new word or heard of a new movie or read a new poem, and suddenly it's everywhere? So you think it's a pretty small community until you get into the community, and before you know it, you realize actually that there are thousands of people out there just cruising the seas really? in their wow. boat. Yeah. And what's really nice about it is, for the most part, the full-time liveaboard cruisers um, operate on a similar budget. You know, so so they'll turn up and nobody expects to go out for lobster dinners every evening and quaff champagne. Uh, everybody recognizes that in order to maintain this lifestyle, you have to maintain a certain standard of living and you have to do your laundry and you sure. have to, you know, you, you bake your bread. Um, if, if you're at anchor, sometimes you, you might be uh, a day's walk from the nearest town. If, if you're living off grid, uh, you know, which is the most delightful thing um, to spend a couple of months at anchor without touching uh, land uh, or, or, or being, in a house really it's, 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 some people would find that terrifying experience no yeah yeah um i i, I know people who who would say to me no and th this is very real concern so you know you have to be compassionate because this is not made up but i couldn't imagine existing without my microwave and <laughs> yeah really? it, it's huh. Yeah, so so occasionally we have conversations with uh, would-be liveaboards. You know, somebody will contact us and we'll say, yeah, yeah, come down, have a chat. You know, and and we'll we will uh, talk about our experience. You know, and and it's really important to share your experience because other people shared their experience with us, and we we pass it on. Um, but but there was one individual was. At the point of crisis, at the idea of being away from the internet for 30 days while crossing the Atlantic. And they said, but is, is it possible? You know, do you know anyone who's done it? And I, and 
the, this guy was around my age, and I said, well, you and I both went about 30 years without the internet, didn't we? <laughs> right, right, right. Where were you? What were you doing before that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it 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 was um, so yeah. P- people uh, really fixate on what they think they need, but the reality is that we need very very little to get to to actually exist in a very happy space. You, you know, a, 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 a nice coffee in the morning, a good book, um, yeah, and and just a good conversation. How was that first, let's say, a couple of months or even a year uh, when you finally did it? Was it a surreal feeling? Because this is something you prepared for so long and worked towards. So it took me, um, I tend to be a pretty chill guy. It took me two years to reach that place. And I remember what it was. Um, So I was the only sailor on the boat. So um, everyone else was learning and could take ropes and that and but I was responsible for all the navigation and making our way up the English Channel, which is uh, quite heavily tidal. It's, it's a very tidal region. And there's a lot of technical sailing goes on and making the best time up, up along there. And then we popped across to France and we got to Brest in France, in Brittany. And I was panicking a little. And I was saying, we have to get across Biscay, but... I, I'm really nervous uh, about crossing Biscay as a solo sailor and being responsible for the, a family and taking this old boat that doesn't have an auto helm. Um, so we, we sail old school, uh, as, as some people, th- there's no gadgets on the boat that sails it for us, um, like a lot of modern sailboats. And I, I found myself spending about two months fretting and worrying, how are we going to get across checking the weather, looking at the systems coming across from the Gulf of Mexico. And and it occurred to me, it, it, this was two years into our travels, and it occurred to me, why, why am I racing? Why am I uh, in a hurry to get across? Where is the rush? And, and the, all, all, the only solution I could arrive at was um, this was drilled into me throughout my life that every project must be completed in a fixed length of time. And it was at that point that uh, Mary and I rambled into a secondhand bookstore on one rainy day in, in Brittany, and I found um, a pilot, which is a book that describes the sailing and, and the waterways in an area. And I flicked through it, and on the first paragraph of the first page, I said, don't leave Brittany without visiting Châtelain and Port Lanay, two lovely little towns. And so we said, yeah, let's go and have a look there. So that was about 12 miles up a river, um, the River Alm. And it was tidal, so we had to make it in good time. But we said, okay, we'll we'll pop up there for two nights and have a look, and then we'll come back down. And it was 13 months later we left wow. the village. Wow. Of 13 months we spent up this river just the most amazing communities that that we encountered up there uh, unbelievable really? i i would say yeah we, we really had to get a move on to to move away from there to head south because we could have disappeared there um for the rest of our lives we just tied up in a stone key uh in the middle of this village the the baker across the road a uh, little town up the road with a library where we could go and, and write a bit. Uh, there were other boat folk and other people who lived in camper vans who would turn up regularly, um, speaking all manner of languages. And we had uh, Luke and Ella, Mary's children, their 14th birthday there. Or maybe it was the, yeah, it was the 14th birthday, I think. Uh, we were there two weeks and we had a party in the in a green area in the middle of the village and everybody came out and they're they're sitting around the table that evening was myself an irishman a scotsman uh, a frenchman uh, and an egyptian um all having a conversation oh there was there were spanish people there as well and and this was it felt like we had two years into our travels it felt like that at that point, that's when we had gotten it right. So it did take about two years to to, um, to shake in. off. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. To to shake off the 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 idea of um, rush now more must get there must achieve, and uh, countless times we've encountered other people who've set out and they go racing around the world and um, they they quite often don't sustain it for any longer than a year or two because it's just so much pressure instead of waking up in the morning and popping your head out and smelling the air and thinking, ah, we won't go today. We'll stay another six months or six right. weeks. Or, if it's a nice day, and if the sun hits your face, you're drinking your coffee, like, yeah, I could be here for a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or uh, alternatively, if the wind feels about right, then yeah, we're, we're going to head to whatever next village. Because if there's one thing that we've learned in our travels is here is just as nice as there. Right, the grass is um, always gr- as green, <laughs> or I don't know. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Um, you know, people have these targets, must get to X town. I've read great things about X city. And if you're traveling like that, uh, we found that that when you arrive in a small t- a small harbor, uh, which are the, the sort of places we prefer to go rather than the big cities, uh, although they're fun too, but when you arrive in a place on a boat, the locals will see you arrive and they've seen many boats arrive and many boats leave and they leave you to get on about your business. But if you're there for two weeks, the moment you cross over into week number three, the locals get curious and they say, Oh, they haven't sailed on like everybody else. They, so they're not on holidays from work. They don't have to be back in the office within two weeks. Who is this family? And then they start conversing with you and they start talking about the children. And in one case, um, a a little old lady turned up with a jar with an adder in it uh, to explain to us, be careful of these snakes. There's lots of them around. Uh, I found this one in my garden so that the children know what it looks like. Don't touch these, you you know, and or they'll, the fisherman will drop a bag of, yeah, the fisherman will drop a bag of fish onto the boat. Um, you become locals, and uh, that seems like the best feeling in the world to become integrated in a small community. You know, it seems like it's it's a dream for most people that they're missing that sense of community as we grow more divided in these times. Yeah, and and um, and of course the the kids. Um, you know, we, we end up uh, multilingual because um, that's what's needed to to interact with the the community. You know, my own language uh, skills are 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 not great because I I tend to to be a little quieter, but uh, certainly the 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 kids. Are, are super uh, and Mary's quite excellent. Uh, my French is stronger than my Spanish, uh, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Fair. You got, you got all the time in the world, I guess. How, how do the kids take it? Do they do they think it's normal that, that they're kind of traveling the world now on a boat? So, so they, um, because of COVID, uh, there were some issues uh, in many countries. Uh, Ireland wasn't um, alone in this around how to matriculate into university for uh, homeschoolers. So what we did was we actually made the decision, and this is one of the beauties of traveling and living as we do, we can make split minute decisions to move country. Um, So we said it's probably best if we are in Ireland for COVID. Mm, Um, And uh, that we needed the support of an established school for them to sit their exams um, for matriculation for university, which, uh, as I said before, uh, education can be had anywhere, but there, there are freedoms to be had from a good degree. So they reintegrated back into uh, the final year of high school, essentially, and it didn't entirely suit them. Um, really? Now, yeah, right. Yeah. Now they they got very good grades and they're in university and the the but language uh, French and Spanish they no problems whatsoever um, English history you know all, all of those subjects uh, because we were teaching them on the boat um, and they they took up Luke took up a, a new subject accounting he'd never done it before. And did it in one year and knocked out. A, I don't remember the exact grade, um, but did, so so they were able to go back and academically 
it wasn't an issue. But the idea of wearing a school uniform and sitting in a classroom. Right, so confined. And, and, yeah. yeah, when these two kids would, the previous year, have been sitting around a dinner table having conversations about politics in a foreign language. Wow, you know, man. uh, uh so, so to take somebody who has experienced that maturity and that worldliness and then put them into a high school setting where the most important thing is um, that somebody was was followed on TikTok or something like that, right, right. The, the, yeah. the comprehension of why that is an interesting thing is, is, is beyond them. But now that they're um, studying in, in third level, they're meeting um, other peers, w- w- you know, studying politics and sociology and um, equine science and those sorts of things. So the, the, it's the, the, the opportunity to expand is there again. And they recognize that that year in school wasn't necessary evil. Um, but the, the languages. Yeah. We'll, we'll take them anywhere, you know. Of course. I, you know, I was a little surprised when I was reading just the beginning of the book. Maybe you'd talk about it later. But you said you started a YouTube channel. I started making videos and it wasn't worth your time, right? But I would think that something for kids, like to make content, I mean, that's probably fun for them. And maybe, you. I mean, obviously, you're trying to get them to avoid the social media nonsense. But at the same time, like, that is also a really valuable skill to be had, which could be fun to make video. I don't know, something like making your kids do it or something. Yeah, they were just not that interested. Oh, really? Okay, fair. <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so I, I recognized early on, you know, when we made our list of things that we needed to move on to the boat, um, one of the thing was, uh, things was, okay, we don't need to earn a lot of money, but we do need to earn some trickle income. Sure. And so, so I put YouTube as part of the list, and, and that's – and, a, again, I sat down and I, I'm – terrible um it's not that i'm bad at doing social media if if that's how i can describe it i know how it works uh, i know what sells and i know how to build followings and all of those but i just could not be arsed it's <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's that because there, there there's no joy to be had from it um so i sat down and i thought okay i'm going to create a youtube channel um that is going to have X number of followers within three months and is going to bring income. And again, people said, yeah, <laughs> uh, millions of people try this. It doesn't work. I said, no, no, no. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to look at how it works. And within three months, I had like a thousand followers uh, and not, not just a thousand uh, harvested followers, but a thousand engaged organic, sailing yeah, uh, people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so it was organic and it was participating. A community, followers. right? So, yeah, so, that's powerful. Yeah, it, pe- people who would comment, people who would like, people who would share, and people who would engage, and they were my people. Um, and we just started doing Patreon, and um, so we were we were making. Um, enough to do a week's shopping every month. So we, we were making one week's income a, a month out of YouTube, um, which is a considerable amount when you live as simply as we do. But it just became uh, a, a too demanding. It, it was taking me 20 hours to produce. Uh, like anybody who does YouTube, they, they know the amount of work yeah. that goes into these It's a things. long game. It's not a short game. You have yeah. to really invest it. And, and it's, it stopped being fun, and I, th- I thought I'm I I'm sailing to get away from this. You know, this is right. disturbing my coffee and my book in the morning. Um, the joy isn't here, so let's go and find the joy somewhere else. And that's when we wrote the book um, because, yeah, the, the the beauty of writing. Um, so on YouTube, uh, you produce your video and you get your your Patreon or you get your sponsorship or you make your your merch uh, sales. Um, and really, it is uh, video by video, you, you know, unless you're hitting the millions, which I'm just not pretty enough to, to sell millions of videos on YouTube. I'm pretty enough, um, but I can't get millions, and, so I don't know. Uh, and, <laughs> I'm okay with that. Okay, it's not saw with the looks, clearly. <laughs> so, so, um, so, but I figured writing is something that, that uh, I enjoy doing, and that 
has the, the the returns are better the royalties uh on on writing are are better than youtube not that they're great and of course we wrote the book knowing that these days you can independently publish if you can't get a traditional publishing deal so the the gatekeepers in the publishing business really ha- have been um circumvented so to speak uh, it, because you can you can put it out there, and, and the royalties on self publishing are much much higher, of course. Um, so we knew writing the book that it wasn't going to end up in a bin. Either somebody would take it up, or we'd put it out there ourselves, sure. and our YouTube followers and and that would would have um, bought copies, and and it would have paid for itself, uh, if you like. So, yeah, YouTube was good. It was fun. Um, and we still get messages back saying, you know, um, we really want more content or why can't you do a video of this thing? Or other people who are more pleasant saying, we hope you guys are still, you know, living the dream and enjoying. Okay, what you're doing or something, today. right? Like something... <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah, a, a bit of that. Uh, uh, there was one comment on one of the videos kind of... Um, Oh, it's something about it's a pity you're still not making videos. Uh, uh, you must be stuck back at work or something like that. You, you know, quite unpleasant. But those people are out there as well. Um, it's people that haven't done their own thing that want you to fail because they see it's really just a mirror that they're talking to, not really anything else. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And and you do have to have a thick skin when you do things differently because, uh, of course, <clears throat> what you're doing um, by doing things a little bit differently. Uh, and this was this was one of the key pieces that that I encountered when we were heading off the boat because I was called irresponsible. I was uh, things like if everyone did this, society would collapse. And I said, that, no, society wouldn't collapse. It would change. It would evolve, but it wouldn't collapse. It would be a different society if everyone did this. But what happens uh, when you step out from uh, from the norm? So you have your social circle and you go to school and you leave school and you're in work and, and everybody identifies with each other and they feel safe because, well, the 10 people around me are doing the same thing I'm doing, so I must be doing okay or I must be doing right. The pack. It's a big and then, pack. And then, yeah. And then when somebody in the group says, Actually, I'm going to quit my job, hop on a boat, and sip pina coladas in the Caribbean uh, while I write. Then what they want to do is they want to stop you from doing that. Because if you do that, then it calls into question, why aren't they also doing something? Because they're from the same social group. And it diminishes their perception of themselves. So rather than take that route, it's much easier to point the finger at the person leaving the group. It's it's a bit like the the, the Psych 101, uh, the gorillas in the room and the table. That the, that story you're familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that. Where mm, it's so you, you have five gorillas in a room and a table in the middle. Uh, it's a thought experiment. Nobody actually did this. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm sure. Table in the middle and sprinkler systems. And you have five gorillas in the room, and you have a you have it set up so that if they climb on the table, the sprinklers come on with icy cold water. So what happens after a little while? The gorillas won't go on the table. So now you have the social convention. Nobody goes on the table. So what you do then is you take one of the gorillas out and you put a new one in. And that gorilla is saying, hey, guys, there's a table there. It's, you know, I'm going up onto this table. What do the other four gorillas do? They drag that new gorilla off the table because they're saying, no, you don't go on the table, the sprinklers will come on. So they drag them off the table. You take out another old gorilla, put another new one in, and he looks at the table and he gets dragged down. Eventually you replace all five gorillas. with. Yeah, you've got five new gorillas in the room. Nobody has ever gone on the table. Nobody knows why you don't go on the table, but you just don't. And you take the sprinkler system out. And that, that's that's what's going on in society where, yeah. you, you know, people, yeah, it's it's all the self-policing. Well, I'm inclined to climb on the table and see what happens. And, uh, it, yeah, it's... There, I, the, it doesn't, the thing is, like, yes, your, your story of living on a boat is a crazy one. But, I mean, I have the same thing when I've told people I was going to quit an engineering job and try to do social yeah. media. Like, it's the same thing. It's the same hurdles, just a different... Uh, what's the expression? 
different yeah. beats to the same drop. I don't know what the expression is, but it, it, that, that yeah, thing is yeah, going to be yeah, there yeah. regardless of what you're doing that's not uh, normal in your social group or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, the, the, that's exactly it. So, yeah, climb on the table, see what Climb happens. on the table, and guys. The, I've been telling the thing people. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, and, and the difficulty, of course, is... If you fail, then everybody will say, see, I knew he'd yes, fail. And course. if you succeed, then he always had something special. You, you know, right. um, I, I, it, it's a bit like, I I don't know if you're uh, a WWE fan. I used to be, Finn yeah, Balor, when I was a kid, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So is, is it Finn Balor is one of the, I, I, I have no idea. I know like Stone Cold, time. The Rock, yeah. all those guys. Yeah, so so I I used to do a bit of pro wrestling as a as a much younger man. Just it it was a, a bit of fun, uh, NWA Ireland, and one of the guys that was coaching and he, he he was new at the time, and he was a bus conductor, and he he quit his job as a bus conductor in Dublin bus, and everybody sort of because he wanted to be a pro wrestler, and it was kind of you know. Oh, that that Fergal, he's he's a funny guy, you know. Uh, and they gave him a toy belt, leaving his job and everything. And he actually went on to a new pro wrestling in Japan, and now he's works at the WWE. He's he's on the full time roster there. And uh, and Becky Lynch actually uh, also wrestled with from WWE. The, she's she's a women's champion or something like that. But uh, again, you. you you do have to, I, I remember at the time, this guy being slated and made fun of, you know, but you, you do have to step out and follow your own path. And of course, the truth is, whether you succeed or fail, you know, in this uh, existentialist universe, it makes no difference. Because in the longest term, um, not that I want to end on a downer, but in the <laughs> longest term, you'll be forgotten about the universe will end and, you know, th- th- nobody is going to judge you in the long term anyway. So don't be afraid to have a goal because that can be taken well. Yeah, that's a really good disappear. lesson. That's a really good lesson. Take the weight off your shoulders. It's it's whether you, you know, succeed or yeah. fail, you're learning something at the end of the day. So it's irrelevant yeah. of, of the outcome, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I wanted absolutely. to ask you because you, you, you were earlier you talking about you know you you get bored really easily with with certain things. Now, part of me thinks, yeah, I agree, I fully can can you know relate. But then I think to myself, well, if I lived on a boat for months at a time, how many things can I really do on a boat before I have that moment of realization? Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Hmm. I've never thought of that before. I've never been asked that question. So, so the, the bolt. What the bolt does? Um, you don't do living on a boat. So it's it's not an it's not an active. Um, you you exist in the boat. So the the, the bolt is is this wonderful capsule that keeps you safe out in nature, and. Uh, when I think of the times when I've been sailing through the night, you, you know, maybe 200 miles from the nearest other person wow. uh-huh. and absolute silence, absolute darkness, so, you know, on a moonless night when there's cloud, you can hold your hand in front of your face and not see your hand, just absolute darkness. And all you can hear is the water passing by the hull and the way and the, the, the wind passing over the sails. And there's just that nothingness, and it allows you to really disappear into your thoughts in a way that's simply not possible in uh, in modern living. You almost float down into your thoughts, and you're in your own mind, and you can see the thoughts. Uh, it's uh, and you can pick one up and bring it in and play with it and push and prod it and put it to one side and see the next passing thought and, and bring that in. And then, of course, you, you're snapped out of it by uh, a phosphorescent dolphin might join you b- beside the boat. And they're leaping, and these golden torpedo tubes of them swimming beside because your eyes are so sensitive to the light. And they, they rise out of a wave, and they're just painted gold. And 
it's impossible. You, you can't photograph it. The cameras are, are, are not sensitive, sensitive enough. And it's one of those things that you have to be there to experience it. So there, there's that shutting down of your, your self um, to an absolute base level where only you exist uh, at that time. And the, the bolt, the vibrations of the bolt are connected to you because you feel every movement and you hear every creak. And it's just the two of you in this universe of, of, of darkness, barring the occasional dolphin disturbing you. So, so it's, you don't do living on the boat. You, you exist within the boat and, and as part of the boat. So you, you never get bored of the environment that you're in. Now, as then what happens when you quieten down and when you spend time in your thoughts, that's when your brain sort of says, okay, I'm feeling a bit peckish. G give me something. It's a bit like, have you ever, um, oh, been on a, a bit of a junk food bender sure. and you're eating pizza and burgers sure. for, you know, and after about a month, you're thinking, oh, I would really love some potato and carrots or I, I, I have an urge for peas or so, you, you know. And that's what happens to your brain. Well, when it shuts down and when it reaches that low level consciousness, it sort of says, um, yeah, this thought that you're holding here at the moment, what, what's the story with this? Where did that come from? And so you reach to the books and you start reading. And that's, that's the, the, the piece that really kicks in after a couple of years you, of no TV and of no radio. <laughs> um, uh, we'd watch a, a movie once a week uh, sort of thing, but the, the stimulus, um, the brain stimulus that you seek out becomes much more wholesome. And a bit like being quite happy with a, uh, a cheese sandwich, your stimulus, the, the, uh, your entertainment becomes much more simple and you're quite happy to listen to a folk song and the words of it and have a conversation about that with somebody for half an hour about what the artist was trying to say. Or somebody might um, bring up, uh, you know, I wonder why dogs became domesticated uh, rather than what uh, lizards, uh, you know. And so there's that, that exploration of all of the simple questions, all of the what seems like nonsense questions. And your brain gets into that analytical uh, place and you start seeking out more and more information. And that's when I started uh, really getting stuck into to philosophy. Um, and I was just gorging books uh, because I had the time and space and the quietness uh, in, in which to read. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really good answer that <laughs> it takes me a little bit to even comprehend what you're saying, because it's almost like a monk like state where you're so in tune with your own thoughts that you can endlessly play with that Play-Doh in your mind. And, and that boredom really is, yeah. is a thing of of only modern civilization. And when you live in a apartment or a house with a massive TV like mine, oh, I'm bored in 15 minutes. But if, if I'm going back into my DNA probably, and I, and I live in this kind of very rudimentary, very basic existence, I find pleasure and, and satisfaction in these very rare moments that I think today's people do not experience. Like... You're talking about a dolphin in a, in a you know pit in a night where it's completely dark. How many people on Earth can relate to that thought, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's and it, it's there to be had. It's uh, you, you just got to go out and find it. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's the bottom line, I guess. Um, simple pleasures. Simple, simple pleasures. pleasures. I think that's a great place to end it. Then that we did an hour and a half. Believe it or not, mm. I really oh I, wow, I really valued and enjoyed this conversation. For anyone that's interested, I'll leave a book. If you're serious about going on a boat, I don't want any people that are pretending they, they're going to do it. They don't have a plan. If you really want to do it, this is the book to read. Uh, I, I'm going to go through it. If you ever want to come back, Leonard, you're always welcome. The door is always open. Are you going yeah, to go sailing soon? It's been a pleasure. Um, well, I'll be back in the boat. with, with uh, Just came off the boat last week. I'll be back in the boat within a week or so. Um, so yeah, ju just back in Ireland, uh, doing a bit of housekeeping essentially. Okay. Any plans um, to go across Europe a little bit? 
Um, no plans but, ever. No plans ever. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Fair. Yeah. No plans ever. We hop in the boat and and sometimes she'll she'll tug us left or tug us right. Um, it's like a, a a family of British sailors that that are new ones. They left Canada with the plan with the planning on heading down to New York, but the wind was contrary, and they ended up in Senegal. Um, yeah, Small they just, that's where the wind was going. Well, if you uh, by accident to end up in Valencia, which is where I hope to be, you know, you have my email. Shoot me a message. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Keep in touch. Keep in touch. Uh, I'll be in in Galicia. There'll always be a bet for you. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much.